Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's telephone town hall. My name is Mitchell, and I'm with Congressman Dan Kildee's office, and I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall. Congressman Kildee is looking forward to taking your questions live and discussing the latest actions in Congress that are happening right now today to provide economic relief to Michigan's small businesses and workers, as well as supporting our health care workers and expanding coronavirus testing. Right now, we're just dialing out to thousands of other mid-Michigan residents who are also going to be joining us and listening in on tonight's call. It takes just a few minutes to complete that dial out, so I really appreciate your patience. Tonight, we're going to be updating you with the most up-to-date information regarding the coronavirus pandemic, including the fourth emergency bill that was uh, currently being voted on in Congress today. Tonight, we'll also be joined live by representatives from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, the Genesee Health System, and the Bay County Health Department. If you have questions at any time for Congressman Kildee, we'll also be taking your questions live. If you have a question about the coronavirus throughout the call tonight, just press zero on your phone keypad right now to be added to the queue. We're going to try to take as many of those questions live tonight as possible. Again, my name is Mitchell. I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall with Congressman Kildee. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the latest actions in Congress to support Michigan's small businesses, workers, seniors during the coronavirus pandemic. Right now, we're just finishing that dial out, as I mentioned, to thousands of other mid-Michigan residents who are also going to be joining us for tonight's call. It takes just a few additional minutes to finish that dial out, so I really, really appreciate your patience. We're going to get started in just a moment, uh, but for those of you that are also interested, the congressman has been sending out regular e-newsletter updates about the coronavirus pandemic. If you are interested in receiving those e-newsletter updates, you can press 7 on your phone right now, and we'll be sure to follow up with you to get added to those e-newsletters. Again, if you're just joining us, my name is Mitchell. I'm the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall with Congressman Dan Kildee. And uh, the congressman's looking forward to taking your questions live and discussing the latest actions in Congress to provide economic relief to Michigan small businesses and workers. Right now, we're dialing out to thousands of mid-Michigan residents who are also going to be listening in on tonight's telephone town hall with us. It takes just a few minutes to complete that dial out, so I really, really appreciate your patience. Tonight, we're going to be updating you on the, uh, with the most up-to-date information regarding the coronavirus pandemic, including a fourth emergency aid bill that's actually being voted on uh, today in Congress. And tonight, we're also joined by representatives from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, the Genesee Health System, and the Bay County Health Department. If you have questions at any time uh, during tonight's event, uh, we're going to be taking your questions live. So just press zero on your phone keypad right now to be added to the queue. Again, we're going to try to take as many of those questions uh, that you have as possible. Again, I'm Mitchell. I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall with the congressman. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the recent actions in Congress to support Michigan small businesses, seniors, and workers during this pandemic. We're just finishing that dial out, as I mentioned. Um, so please uh, just wait a few additional minutes as we finish that dial out. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, for those of you that are interested, Congressman Kildee is sending out regular e-newsletter updates about the coronavirus. If you're interested in receiving those e-newsletter updates, just press 7 on your phone right now, uh, and we'll be sure to follow up with you to make sure you're added to those email updates, as I mentioned earlier. Um, again, we're just finishing that dial out. It takes one more minute. Uh, my name is Mitchell, and I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's telephone town hall with Congressman Dan Kildee, as well as representative, uh, with representatives from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, the Genesee Health System, and the Bay County Health Department. We're going to be talking about the latest actions in Congress uh, that are happening today to support Michigan's small businesses, seniors, workers uh, during this coronavirus pandemic. Um, and with that said, uh, uh, I, without further ado, I will turn it over to Congressman Dan Kildee for some opening remarks. Congressman, thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, this is Congressman Dan Kildee, and I really appreciate you all joining me tonight. I look forward to taking your questions live. This is the third telephone town hall that I've hosted in the last few weeks to keep mid-Michigan residents informed about the coronavirus pandemic. And tonight, I'm really pleased to be joined by Cheryl Thompson from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Dan Russell from the Genesee Health System, as well as Dr. Thomas Bender from the Bay County Health Department. My priority 
has been and continues to be ensuring that our states have the resources they need to respond to this outbreak and to minimize the effect on our residents, our families, on our communities. Uh, just today, in fact, at this very moment, Congress is voting on a fourth emergency bill. I'll actually have to step away just for a few minutes to go cast that vote. Uh, this bipartisan bill, which is supported by Democrats and Republicans across the aisle, is the fourth bill Congress will have enacted in just six weeks to help families, seniors, and small businesses. And I wanted to just take a minute to update you on what we're voting on right this minute. The Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act is all about supporting workers, small businesses, hospitals, and healthcare workers, and very importantly, expanding testing. This $484 billion legislation, which is the result of a compromise between the Democrats and Republicans, first and foremost includes more money for small business relief. It, it provides $310 billion to replenish the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a relief program that Congress created to support small businesses. The PPP program supports small businesses through loans that are forgivable loans up to $20 million. Loans that are forgiven if the small business uses most of that money to keep workers on the payroll during the pandemic. So while Congress initially appropriated $350 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program due to the demand it was clear that we needed to pass additional relief, and I believe we'll have to do even more after this. While I've um, always supported fast and immediate relief for small business, it's also important that we get it right. We have to make sure that this money is going to the hands of the mom and pop small businesses, those in Flint, Saginaw, Bay City, Esco, to every other community across mid-Michigan. The businesses on Main Street, the barber shop, the beauty shop, the donut shop, they have to come first. The money was meant for those small businesses to keep their workers on the payroll until we can get through the pandemic. In recent weeks, the administration has processed the, these initial rounds of PPP loans, and we've seen reports that large publicly traded companies worth hundreds of millions of dollars were given loans under this program. In one instance, we saw a high-end state chain with 150 locations and 5,700 employees get a $20 million loan. But I've also heard from small businesses right here in mid-Michigan with 10 employees that couldn't get a loan as small as $20,000. That's a problem. And that's why it took us some time to make the changes in the program that we're voting on today. We have to address it. So in today's legislation, I pushed for and was able to secure a change that requires a large portion of the additional relief be set aside for truly small businesses, often in underserved or in rural communities that have issues accessing these PPP loans. Again, no small business on Main Street should be left out of receiving this help, and we have to do all we can to support them. As I said before, this funding is about keeping workers on the payroll of Michigan small businesses. So the bill we're passing today also includes $75 billion to support hospitals, healthcare workers, and other health organizations on the front lines of this pandemic, including funding for more personal protective equipment. This is in addition to the $200 billion that Congress previously passed for PPE, personal protective equipment. And finally, the bill we're passing today includes $25 billion to focus on coronavirus testing. I believe everyone in Michigan, every Michigander who wants to get tested should be able to do so. And so as we look to safely reopen our economy, increase and in expanding testing is going to be absolutely critical to that process. A few other um, comments I received regarding economic relief for families and seniors. Regarding cash, uh, cash payments, Congress recently passed legislation to provide $1,200 for Americans plus $500 per child under 17 years old. So for a typical family of four, they'll receive $3,400 in relief. These payments have started to go out from the IRS. 
For those who have their bank account information on file with the IRS, which is about 80 million Americans, they started to receive those payments through direct deposits. Likewise, if you're on Social Security and you have your payments automatically deposited as well, you'll receive your benefits that way. For others, you'll likely receive a mailed check. Paper checks started going out this week prioritizing those Americans with the lowest incomes. I urge the IRS to get these payments out as quickly as possible. Regarding unemployment insurance, I know that a lot of Michiganders continue to experience trouble filing their claims. Over the last month, over 1.1 million Michiganders filed for unemployment. That's a 5,000% increase in claims happening in just a few weeks. So far, Michigan's Unemployment Insurance Agency has been able to provide about 820,000 unemployed Michiganders with $1.37 billion in benefits. That's 820,000 of the 1.1 million that are filing for unemployment. We know that the Unemployment Insurance Agency is adding more staff and improving their technology to respond better and faster to these claims. And although the unemployment agency is administered at the state level, I am working to try to help troubleshoot any issues. So if you are having continued issues with your unemployment insurance claim, please contact my congressional office. Uh, it's important to know that I recently supported an expansion of unemployment benefits that was signed into law. While the maximum, typically the maximum benefit in Michigan is $362 a week, the CARES Act, which I supported, added an additional $600 per week and an additional 13 weeks. So the bill uh, expanded unemployment insurance benefits for all, but also included self-employed individuals, 1099 contractors or gig economy workers. As I said, we passed four coronavirus emergency relief bills in six weeks. These bills included a lot of aspects of the problem, free coronavirus testing for Americans, purchase of PPE for healthcare workers, expanded paid leave for workers, additional support for food assistance, forgivable small business loans, funding for Michigan's Medicaid program. And I've been posting daily updates on my website, which is www.dankildy.house.gov, with details on all of this legislation and how it may impact you and your family. So while Congress continues to pass more emergency relief today, I believe we clearly will need to do more. This pandemic is impacting the lives of every American, and I know we have to do more to support families, to support small businesses, to support seniors through these tough times. So I support and I'm working on additional legislation, including additional direct cash payments to Americans, and especially hazard pay for essential workers who are working to support our economy and to support people in healthcare especially, and of course funding for state and local governments that are really getting hit hard. Finally, let me say this, I know that these are incredibly stressful times for everybody in our state, everybody across the country. My team and I are working seven days a week around the clock to answer your questions to provide the community resources, to provide up-to-date and accurate information. So please don't hesitate to reach out to my office anytime by calling 810-238-8627. We are all in this together. Everyone plays an important role in continuing to practice social distancing and following the guidelines from Governor Whitner, Whitmer, from the CDC, and from the medical experts. We'll get through this tough time as a community and as a state, we must make sure we're doing all we can to prevent the virus from spreading to others. So thank you. I wanted to, it took a little longer than I normally would, but I wanted to make sure to get you all the information as up to date as possible. Uh, we can do a lot to help one another. The most important thing we can do is follow the medical guidance, listen to the experts, stay home, save lives, slow down the spread. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mitchell to continue tonight's conversation. Thanks so much, Congressman. Again, this is Mitchell. I'm the moderator for tonight's 
telephone town hall. Um, and again, if you have a question at any time for Congressman Kildee or any of the other representatives uh, who are on the phone with the congressman tonight, just press zero on your phone right now to be added to the queue. We're going to try to take as many of those questions uh, as possible. Uh, now uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, for just brief remarks to Cheryl Thompson. Um, Cheryl is the Deputy Director uh, of Economic Stability at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you for opening remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Congressman, for. Oh, Cheryl, we're having a little trouble hearing you. I, I, you may have some bad reception. I don't know if you can move to a different area. Okay, well, while we try to get Cheryl back on the line, uh, I apologize about that. We'll bring in Cheryl Thompson with the Michigan Department of Health and Human S Services here shortly. Uh, but, Congressman, maybe we can just start taking some questions um, from participants on the line as well. Um, I, we have a question um, from Catherine. Catherine is from Linden, uh, and Car uh, uh, or Carol, I'm sorry, Carol from Linden. Uh, and she and she has a question about testing. Um, so your line is now open. Hi. Um, actually, it is Kathy. My name is Kathy Du Bois, oh, sorry, and I would Kathy. like to see. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to see more of our money be focused on creating the tests that um, show the antibodies and everyone being able to get those readily available. I believe so many people have already had this virus that did not. Um, have this, the, the strong symptoms. People in my own family, I, I really believe they have had this. So I wanted to know how readily available those are now, where and how do you get those, and um, what money is being focused on creating those for everyone? Because if you know you've had it, then you should be able to go back to work without fear. And I think that's huge. Thanks, um, Kathy. We have um, Dr. Thomas Bender on the line, who's an epidemiologist at the Bay County Health Department. Dr. Bender, uh, would you like to take Kathy's question? I get your sentiments, and I share them in terms of the uh, intended purpose of uh, antibody testing. Uh, unfortunately, we are not yet at a point where there has been um, any any antibody test approved by FDA or any antibody test that's been validated uh, for uh, the sort of purpose that you're describing. And um, unfortunately, you can find antibody testing uh, that is being made available in various communities in Michigan, including Bay County, where I uh, work in the health department. Um, but I would not recommend seeking that testing at this point. Um, it is uh, not uh, reliable. Uh, it's likely uh, it as not to give you a false uh, result as it is to give you a, an accurate result. Uh, and so okay. for now, I would, I would steer you toward, if, if you have a, a family member who is um, uh, currently symptomatic, uh, and, and falls into, you know, uh, a, a high-risk group or, uh, or is a healthcare worker or a first responder, then uh, you would fall into one of the um, higher priority groups for testing using the um, uh, reliable uh, PCR-based testing. Uh, and that is something that uh, is, um, you know, uh, available. It, it does not answer the question that you uh, pose, which is if you might have been infected in the past and have now cleared that infection, uh, do you have, ha have you mounted a protective immune response? And, and the PCR testing can't, can't answer that question. Eventually, there will be, uh, I think, antibody testing that has been uh, demonstrated to be validated and uh, reliable. And I know that NIH and uh, FDA are working on studies uh, to evaluate some of the uh, great number of tests that have been introduced to the marketplace. Um, but all of the tests that are currently available uh, lack FDA approval. Uh, they have not been validated, and I, I, would, I would spend uh, your money on something else than buying those tests right now. Congressman, would you also like to weigh in on Kathy's question?
Congress earlier. Ago. I know. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, I was just going to say that one of the things that the legislation that I'm actually walking over to vote on right now does is require a national plan around testing. The $25 billion will fund that, but what we ask for is within two weeks to have a comprehensive national plan around testing. So that's an important aspect of it. So it's a good question. It's one that we hope we can get some guidance from science on, especially by putting together this much more intentional national plan around testing. So thank you for your question. Um, thanks so much. I don't. Um, Cheryl Thompson uh, with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Are you back on the phone with us, Cheryl? Yes, I apologize. My call just dropped. No so worries. We can hear you loud and clear now. So I, I don't know if you just wanted to give a just a brief comment. Uh, I know you've been helping with the local emergency response to the coronavirus as well. We wanted to just give you a chance to comment. Mm -hmm. All right. I didn't hear any of the previous comments, so I don't know what was said. So I'll just quickly talk about what, what DHS is doing, if that's okay. Um, again, I don't know where I dropped off at, but I want to thank the Congressman for allowing me this opportunity to come on here and to talk about the changes that demonstrate the active efforts by the department to take steps necessary to provide benefits to Michigan families and ensure benefits are not interrupted due to this pandemic. And we have been taking steps to do this since March. Um, one of the things, and I know this has something to do with Congressman Kildee um, making sure this happens, but for those, he talked about the economic stimulus payments. Those will not apply as countable income for any MDHHS program. And I think that's really important to make sure that we stress because anytime there's income, we usually will deduct something. So I want to make sure I say that. Um, and then the other thing that we're really proud about is under effective March 27th, under the, under the direction of the federal government, DHS began providing emergency allotments to address temporary food needs due to the COVID-19. <clears throat> so families who are receiving uh, uh, food assistance payments are going to get uh, a two-month allotment. So just to give an example of that, if someone was only receiving $25 on their food assistance payment, they will now get the maximum benefits. So, for instance, for a group size of one, they would get 194 for both March and um, and April. And then for a family of four, it would be like $646. So those began going out um, early, uh, at the end of last month and beginning of April. So we're really proud in regards to that. And then I'm very proud of Michigan because we are the first state in the country authorized by the federal government to administer a pandemic EBT program. This is available for children eligible for free and reduced lunch for ages 5 to 18. <clears throat> so any child that's already in the school that's receiving free or eligible lunch, they are going to get an EBT card. If they don't have an active food assistance case, they're going to receive one in the mail for those who already have one, then they will be loaded onto their EBT card. And I do, uh, this includes children who attend private schools, charter schools, Head Start, or who are homeschooled if their school is associated with the Michigan Department of Education and are currently eligible for the free lunch program. So we're really excited about that. The other two things I'll just say, if anyone is applying for cash assistance and we normally have them uh, look for work activities, those have been suspended. We've also made sure that all Medicaid closures have been stopped effective March the 20th unless a client requests closure or moves out of state. Our state emergency relief, which is really important right now given what we're going through, that helps to pay for rent and some energy costs and to address household energy and needs. And so we have raised those caps from $1,200 to $1,500 for deliverable fuels. Um, a, phone a phone interview is no longer required. And in the past, we would only do a one-time do a one -time energy assistance program. That has been, that rule has been suspended. So it's no longer limited to once per year. And again, the non-cash asset limits have been increased to $1,500. Um, Fifteen thousand um, dollars. I know that the previous uh, speaker was talking about the testing site. So in Genesee County, we've been really working to make sure we have testing sites all over um, Genesee. We started with Hurley on uh, last week, 
and that's going really well. And then we have some other that are going to come that are going to be coming up. And I know we have Dan Russell on from Genesee Health System, so I'm going to let him talk about that. But one of the things I really want to say is the testing criteria for coronavirus has been expanded in Michigan to include individuals with mild symptoms. Essential workers still reporting to work in person, whether they have symptoms or not. And then we just ask that if anyone needs to have a test, that they please go get it because we're really trying to even do contact tracing. So if someone has been confirmed, then we're trying to figure out who they may have been in contact with so we can try to eliminate that. And then really quickly, and I'll end here, um, just to give you some numbers, in Genesee County, we had 1,387 confirmed cases, 144 deaths. In Saginaw, 507 confirmed cases, 38 deaths. Bay County, 102 confirmed with two deaths. Shiawassee had 125 confirmed cases with six deaths. Aranac, 15 confirmed with one death. Iosco, 21 confirmed with three deaths. And Tuscola had 76 confirmed and 12 deaths, and that was as of today. So total, we have 35,291 um, uh, cases in Michigan with, two, with 2,977 deaths. Um, if anyone has any questions in regards to COVID, we do have a hotline that's available seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And that hot, COVID hotline number is 888-535-6130. And we encourage anyone to call there if you have any questions. Great. Um, thanks so much, Cheryl. Again, this is Mitchell. Uh, we have some more questions coming in, and I also got my eye here on C-SPAN. I just saw Congressman Kildee vote, so I know he's he's um, coming back to join us as well soon. So we have a question coming from Craig um, from Linden. Craig, um, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Yeah. Uh, hey, this is Craig from Linden, and... I was wondering, how can we get get it across to people that Gretchen Whitmer is not the bad person here? That, you know, we need to do the self-quarantining, you know, to so that we don't get more people infected. And another thing, it would be nice if I could get more face masks. Thanks, um, Craig. I don't know... Um Congressman, if you're back with us yet and you wanted to to respond to Craig's question? Yeah, I could. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah. Well, thank you, Craig, for that. And I, I do think you make a good point. Uh, no matter what sort of end or side of the political spectrum anybody is on, I think this is one of those moments where we should just set all that aside, follow the science, follow the guidance we're getting from health professionals, and people still may have disagreement about the conclusions that policymakers make, whether it's me as a member of Congress or the governor or the president. The most important thing is that we keep our eye on the prize. And the, the goal is stop the spread of this terrible disease. Nobody's individual interest should trump all the rights that all of us have to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think we need to be careful. And so what I've been trying to do, even despite the fact that it's okay for people to have different points of view, is to try to tone it down to the extent possible and just focus on what like we're doing today, a bipartisan effort, Democrats and Republicans coming together to pass relief and then live to fight these other battles another day. So I'm glad you raised that question. On the issue of PPE and getting more masks, that is one of the things that we address in the legislation that we passed today. Uh, it's, a, it's a serious need, and it's one that needs a lot of financial resources behind it. So thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, Congressman. Our next question comes from Carol. Um, Carol is from Flushing. Uh, Carol, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Yes, this is Carol Mattoon from Flushing, and I have two issues. Um, I'm really disappointed that there was not money in there to fund the states and the localities. seems like that should be a top issue, considering that's who the frontline people are taking care of it. And also, uh, to protect our democracy during this crisis, I would hope that the next bill would have something in that, that states can switch to vote by mail for November, August and November. So are the, is that one even in consideration at this point? 
I can uh, I can address. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, Carol, you're absolutely right on both of those points. And this is one of those areas where there is disagreement between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I was really disappointed to see Leader McConnell uh, today indicate that he thought that states should consider bankruptcy. I don't think that's an option. Uh, we do need, and we fought for, and we continue to fight for, direct support for state government and local government for not just the COVID-19 additional costs that they are going to bear, which are very serious, because as you said, Carol, that's the front line of this fight. State government, especially in local governments, particularly. But we need to also help them by dealing with the reality that slowing or shutting down parts of the economy will reduce the revenue that those state and local governments have to provide other basic services like police and fire and all the things that we all depend upon. So it's, uh, it's been our goal, and I've been working with a lot of people in our Michigan delegation on this, because Michigan's particularly hard hit, to get money. We did get some in the, in the, in the last bill for state and local government. But this bill, Leader McConnell decided that he would not agree to that, and we're going to have to fight that out in the next CARES bill, which should come up in the next couple of weeks. And the same goes for the issue of election, the election process. Uh, we already know that, I believe it was in the case of Wisconsin, where an in-person election day was held, that there are coronavirus cases that are directly traceable to that election day. In Michigan, we're fortunate in that we now have law that allows no reason absentee voting, but we need to make sure that people are aware of that and that they get you know, notice that they can file for their absentee ballot so that they can actually vote by mail. These are two really fundamental questions. I'm glad you raised them. Thank you. Thanks, Congressman. Um, our next question comes from John. Uh, John is from Grand Blank. Uh, John, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Well, good evening. Uh, I can't help but wonder uh, how many of our virus deaths are folks who died with the virus rather than of the virus. As an example, we know that more men die with prostate cancer than die of prostate cancer. Now, let's say that a person has many of the underlying conditions uh, that the elderly have or that, that makes them more vulnerable or susceptible to the virus. If they die with the virus, but yet they have these underlying conditions that were complicated both ways, both by the virus and the virus was complicated by those issues or those diseases, how are we classifying it? I'm afraid if they're all being grouped together as virus deaths caused by the coronavirus, then I'm afraid we're getting some skewed data there, folks. Thanks, John, for your question. I know we have um, Dr. Bender on the line, as well as Cheryl Thompson and Dan Russell from Genesee Health Systems. I don't know if any of you would like to answer the question. Uh, this is Thomas Bender. Um, I can speak to it if you'd like. Um, so, uh, in fact, there has been uh, quite a bit of discussion uh, as to the coding of, of death certificates for um, uh, people who are passing away with COVID-19. Uh, I was part of a discussion with the National Center for Health Statistics that spoke directly to this topic. Um, it, is, uh, it is something that I can tell you that is uh, uh, receiving careful attention. Um, for the most part, the people who uh, are uh, dying of COVID-19 um, are dying with uh, uh, a type of pneumonia or other respiratory failure that is um, not subtle. Uh, and it's, it's not uh, a presentation that is uh, likely to be explained away because of other um, conditions. Now, you are correct that uh, there are uh, many people in our population who have underlying medical conditions that put them at a higher risk of severe presentation and a higher risk of death from uh, infection with COVID-19. Um, but, you know, it, it is not, uh, I think, uh, the case uh, or accurate to say that uh, these uh, 
very that, that it's not accurate to say that very many of these deaths should be uh, chalked up to um, other other causes. Thanks, Dr. Bender. Um, our next question um, comes from Daniel. Daniel is from Linwood. Uh, Daniel, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Hello, Mr. Kildee. Dan Vermees, your local 699 UAW, Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, I met you this spring. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, is the paycheck protection, including the $13 frontline worker pay increase, is that till the end of the year? And is it included in that bill? And also, public salt sector healthcare, healthcare employees haven't been given any extra time off for the COVID illness. Um, my daughter was actually confirmed with uh, COVID three weeks ago. She's been self-tested. She's on another week quarantine because she was faint line tested, but she was a newer employee, employee and they're giving her time off, but they have given her nothing besides the time off to get better. And these people that are going out front line working and fighting this every day, I think we need to sharpen our pencil a little bit for these front line workers and, and get them a little bit more support, maybe some uh, SNA sick pay, anything in the public sector. And also I love to give props to Tom Hurst, my local uh, president, and Jacob for stepping up for my uh, unemployment mess. So you guys helped tremendously. I got paid today. That's all I have. Uh, Congressman, um, I wondered if you want to uh, take Daniel's question. Uh, I believe you're on mute, Congressman. No, we we still can't hear you, Congressman. Okay. Um, oh, now we can. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. All right. They had me on the other line that I was using when I was uh, going over the floor. Well, thanks, first of all, for that comment. And you're right. Uh, I've got a great staff. Jacob Bent, who's my deputy district director, has been doing – uh, great work in helping people navigate that process, so I'll make sure to give him a pat on the back. Um, on the issue of hazard pay, uh, this is an issue that is not included in this legislation. Uh, I know Senator Peters in particular has been pushing his HEROES Act, which would, would uh, pr provide the additional $13 per hour that you referenced for those frontline health care workers. But I've been talking to some local business leaders uh, as well about the fact that we need to make sure that we're providing some additional, either a retention bonus or hazard pay for those folks who are in essential functions. I mean, obviously the healthcare workers are frontline and they deserve that hazard pay and that sort of hero pay. But those folks who are working in a grocery store or stocking the grocery store or are in the food supply chain somewhere or are, you know, you know doing the basic things like road and street maintenance. Uh, there's one particular business owner that I've been talking to that, that provides a lot of the contract road and street maintenance, which is necessary in order for us to keep moving product and material around the country, around the state. We need to be able to make sure that those employees get some additional benefit, particularly in the case where you might have some employees who are in essential functions and some who are on layoff because the particular role that they play is not deemed essential. We need to make sure that we're rewarding those folks who are having to come into work, who are doing a hard job, and accepting the additional risk that comes with having to participate in the economy. Um, that's a that's a, a real challenge, and so we need to uh, we need to uh, address that. The hope is that we will have legislation that we can include in the next bill. But just like the question that, uh, um, that Carol asked, Carol from Flushing asked earlier, um, one of the reasons that we, we are continuing to do these bills in sort of a series is that we're doing them in a bipartisan fashion because we have divided government. And that often means making compromises and then sort of fighting another day for some of these other elements that we need to include. This is one of those. So I'm glad you raised it. You're absolutely right. It continues to be a high priority for me. Uh, and we'll try to you know, keep you posted on how we're doing with it. So thanks for the call. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Congressman. Our next question comes from Paul. Um, Paul is from Swartz Creek. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Flint Township, Paul. Uh, and Paul, your line is on uh, unmuted to ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Congressman McKelvey, this is Paul Gilly from uh, Flint, Branch 256 of the National Association of Letter Carriers. Hey, Paul. Uh, two things. How are you doing, brother? 
Uh, two big concerns that I have is, you know, we're out here every day, as you know, and we literally interact with, you know, hundreds of thousands of homes, millions of homes across the country. If I am of the opinion that I, I am of concern for, for not just my health, because I'm here to serve, but I'm concerned about what I may be bringing into the homes of communities that we serve. Is it, is it, are we ever going to get to a point where if I wake up in the morning and I say there's something drastically wrong with me that I can go somewhere and say I need to know that I am safe to go out and do my job without bringing harm to those I serve? Is, is that possible? Yeah, so two things. One, and I might ask uh, either Dan, uh, Russell, or Cheryl to address this issue of you know being able to go somewhere to determine whether you are potentially putting somebody at risk, because that really does get to the issue of, more, of broader and more expanded uh, testing. We hope that the money that we just voted on, uh, they're still voting actually right now, we hope that that um, will get quickly into the communities like uh, Flint and Genesee County, Bay City, Saginaw, so that more testing can be done to answer the very question that you asked. I do think you raised a larger question, though, about the Postal Service, and you, we've talked about this in the past. We depend on the United States Postal Service, especially right now. More people are dependent on the United States Postal Service than ever before, even though it's always been so important. For many people, using my mom as an example, being able to get her medications delivered to her by the U.S. Postal Service, knowing that they will be there six days a week and sometimes seven to deliver that you know, it's not just about getting a letter in the mail. Sometimes it's about getting life-saving medication. And so I think one of the things that we're working on, number one, is to try to get standards in place for COVID-19, for postal workers, but for also other frontline workers, so that there is guidance from the Occupational um, Health and Safety uh, uh, Administration, Safety and Health Administration, so that we know what the rules of the road ought to be for somebody who's working in this environment and either could contract or uh, spread this deadly virus. We need OSHA guidance. We need a rule so that we have standards for the workplace, whether it's a healthcare worker or somebody uh, working in the Postal Service. But I also think it's a moment of reflection for us all. We depend on the Postal Service. We ought not put the Postal Service in a position where it's financially upside down, and we have a chance to do some, I think, very important reforms to get rid of the 75-year pre-funding requirement for postal retirement, for example. That would help, and I think, demonstrate to the United States Postal Service and the workers there that we actually do appreciate the incredible work they do. So thanks for your call. Mitchell, back to you. Thanks, Congressman. Um, our next question is from Phyllis. Uh, Phyllis is from Schwartz Creek. Uh, Phyllis, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Yes, I'm wondering if they have any updates on how long this virus stays on surfaces. Like, just go with the question ahead of time with the post office. If I put a letter out in my uh, mailbox, how long, if I had some of that virus, how long is that going to stay on that envelope for that postman to pick up? Thanks, Phyllis, um, for the question. I don't know um, if Dr. Thomas Bender or, or Cheryl Thompson or Dan Russell would like to answer the question. I can speak to that. So, uh, in fact, this has been studied, and uh, there is a, a variable duration of, of virus persistence on surfaces depending on what type of material you're talking about. With paper, um, as you know, a letter would be composed of, uh, you're looking at up to uh, four to five days that a uh, virus could persist on paper. Um, I got actually a question from um, Representative Kilby's uh, uh, staff member, uh, uh, Jacob Bennett, uh, asking about uh, sending, uh, you know, cards to um, residents of uh, assisted living, and I, I thought that was a great idea, um, but, you know, one of the ways you could do that safely would be uh, to collect those letters and then let them sit for the for the um, uh, duration of the week, pick them up on Monday, 
uh, send them out on Friday, and then uh, by that point, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. So there, there are ways that you can mitigate that risk with a little bit of delay and uh, should, shouldn't be a problem. Thanks, Dr. Bender. Um, uh, our next question comes from Walter. Uh, Walter is from my hometown of Bay City. Walter, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking my call today. Uh, first, I want to um, thank um, Congressman Kildee and his staff who worked with me on unemployment, um, Jake and uh, Karma, both. Um, I got a call today, finally, after a couple weeks, and my situation is taken care of. Um, and my wife will be taken care of very shortly. So thank you again for um, helping me and getting that taken care of. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the um, 39 weeks of unemployment. Um, is that for everybody? I think Jake said he was going to take care of it or, t or look into it, but um, you mentioned 39 weeks earlier in the call. Um, my dashboard only shows 26, and my wife's shows 39. So that was one question I had. Uh, second is regarding mail-in voting. Um, what precautions are in place um, handling an excessive load of mail-in ballots? I just recently saw an article circulating regarding the city clerk in Southfield, Michigan, um, and the fraud that was committed there. Uh, if that is something that is true, what precautions would be in place to handle um, an abundance of uh, mail-in voting outside of the absentee military and um, government officials. Uh, Congressman, would you like to take uh, Walter's question? Congressman, if you're there, we, we can't hear you, unfortunately. You may be on mute. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can now, yes. Okay, all right. For the, uh, the issue of unemployment, um, so what, what Congress enacted was the $600 uh, dollar per week supplement through July 31 and the 13-week extension beyond Michigan's 26 weeks. So if somehow there's a mistake or an error, we can deal with that. Um, but the, the extension is on the, on the end of a person's 26-week uh, state eligibility. So it may just be that there's a timing issue, but we can certainly work with you on that. On the issue of mail-in voting, um, you know, we have always had mail-in voting. It's a matter of now the volume. I know that since we changed the law in Michigan, like, for example, in the, um, in the presidential uh, uh, primary election that was just held, a really a much more significant percentage of those votes came in as mail-in voting. There are going to be challenges, and one of the problems that we see is that local governments don't have the financial resources or haven't committed the financial resources to properly manage those elections with the volume that they have. Uh, we have been pushing for additional resources uh, for election protection, basically protecting our democracy. It's a big part of our agenda here to try to help stand up better systems administered at the state and local level for election administration. Um, the integrity of our elections are important, but we need to make sure that we're providing adequate protections and that those local governments have the technical knowledge and the security systems in place to make sure that the system has integrity. We think there's a federal role. It's a state responsibility and a local responsibility, but since the federal government um, you know, we have federal elections, we need to be a part of the solution, and I've been pushing for additional support to those local clerks so that they can have the resources they need to make sure they're doing it right. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, our next question comes from Robert. Uh, Robert is from Mount Morris uh, and has a question about contact tracing. Robert, your line is unmuted uh, to ask a question. Yes, thank you. I'd like to volunteer to become a contact tracer. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of work to be done. Um, I would need some minimal training. Um, I have a master's degree. I'm a retired counselor, so this shouldn't be too difficult to task to learn. I want to know how I would get through that, but I'm also concerned about 
the PPE for our healthcare workers. I understand from talking to a friend of mine yesterday that Beaumont has closed a hospital down in Wayne County. I don't have any idea as to why, but apparently they've just shut the entire hospital down. And that's kind of alarming given what we're going through. Um, thank you, Robert. I don't know, uh, Dan Russell from the Genesee Health System, I don't know if you wanted to take the first part of the question about local efforts on contact tracing. Yeah, I will I will do that. Thank you. Uh, this is Dan Russell from Genesee Health System. Uh, just recently, uh, we have been contacted uh, about an effort to start that, um, looking at contact tracing locally. So it is really too, too early to give you any information um, on that, I would imagine at some point we, we certainly will be looking for volunteers. Um, but if you want to contact me through Genesee Health System, and, and my uh, contact information is on our website, uh, when we get to that point and they um, start looking for volunteers, I would certainly let you know that. Thanks, um, Dan. Our next Mitchell, question is from Mitchell. Go ahead. Mitchell, can I yeah, just ahead, add something to that? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, Go ahead, Dr. Bender. Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a uh, state of Michigan uh, volunteer website that you can go and register for. Uh, and it, when you go to the, the state of Michigan website to, to find this volunteer uh, registration, you can choose from different buckets of response. And one of those buckets is public health response. So if you wanted to sign up there, uh, that would be one way to get yourself plugged in. Uh, the other thing that you can do if you want to um, get yourself prepared for this role is uh, you can go and uh, sign up for an account on what's called uh, MyTrain or, or Michigan uh, Training uh, website, and there is a, a free training module for contact tracing that's uh, already available on MyTrain. Uh, so anybody that wanted to um, uh, you know, brush up on that topic and be prepared to, to serve as a volunteer in that role, that would be a great way to do that. I just wanted to give the, 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 the website that he was referring to. It's www.michigan, spelled out, M-I-C-H-I-G-A-N, dot G-O-V slash COVID-19. And if you click on there, it has all of the resources, and that is one of them that we are definitely looking for volunteers. Congressman, did you have any comments as well? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question because I think this has got to be a part of a national strategy to come out of this. I mean, we know that sheltering in place is having an effect on bending the curve and, or, or reducing the curve on all this, but the, um, the necessity of doing high-level testing, contact tracing, isolation, and treatment is really going to be important as we sort of stand up the economy. Um, I was thinking of Dan uh, Russell because of the work um, that Genesee um, did during the and continues to do during the Flint water crisis, sort of standing up some capacity. Um, many of us in Washington are pushing in the next round of funding uh, for funding for a, a, essentially a civilian health corps that would work to do the kind of contact tracing, for example, that's happening in Massachusetts right now. They've employed about 1,000 people in Massachusetts. It took them a few weeks to get it stood up um, to do the contact tracing, to try to identify and get ahead of the spread of the disease and begin to do the testing in isolation that is going to be so important if we're going to get people going back to work. And so we have organizations on the call right now that would be a part of that and that I've been thinking about as we've been pushing that forward. But I think it's a very important part of the, the solution to this problem. Thank you for the call. Thank you, Congressman. Our next question is from Pamela. Uh, Pamela is from Grand Blank. Uh, Pamela, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Thank you for taking my call. I have two issues. First of all, I'd like to thank Governor Whitmer for caring about Michiganders versus our previous governor and his administration that did not care about the people of Flint who lived there, worked there, and went to school there. My question for you is um, about Senator McConnell's idea to have states 
file for bankruptcy. Um, I just don't know if this is a way for him and his friends to go after um, public employee pension plans such as my husband is a recently retired uh, public school teacher or firemen, policemen. They may be protected because they supported um, other candidates before, but I know definitely the teachers and maybe the public, um, you know, the state of Michigan employees. That's, that's my question, sorry. Thanks, Pamela. Congressman, did you want to respond to Pamela? Sure, yeah, thank you for the call. Yeah, and I saw uh, Leader McConnell's comments. Uh, it was on a radio program, apparently, um, that he made these comments that rather than providing this direct support for states that maybe they can file bankruptcy. Um, I hope that he was being glib, but I've heard some from some of my colleagues that, um, that, that he may have an agenda. I don't know. I will say this. It's not the solution to the problem because whether it's a small business or even a medium-sized business or a state government for that matter, this is a situation that nobody asked for, that none of the people running these organizations um, can be held accountable for the fact that we've had this, this global pandemic occur that has, in the case of state government, caused dramatic loss of sales tax and income tax revenue, then they still need to provide services. So this is where I think a strong federal response is warranted and it shouldn't be the case where a national leader says to the states, well, you're on your own. We've never been on our own when we face a national crisis. That's not the patriotic thing to do. When we face national crises, I think about the greatest generation, uh, the generation of World War II, they came together, they made sacrifice, and we were one country. And I don't think it helps as we're facing this other silent, invisible enemy that we should say to the states, especially the hardest hit states like Michigan with uh, the 10th largest state but the third most cases. I don't think that uh, a national leader is being very patriotic when he says, you know, you're on your own. We're in this together. We need to find a solution together and I'm going to continue to fight to make sure that the state governments and the local governments that are especially hard hit get the help they need. Thanks, Congressman. Um, our next question comes from Rita. Uh, Rita is from Burton. Uh, Rita, your line is unmuted to ask your question. Hi. First, I'd like to say thank you so much for letting me participate. My second town hall meeting that I have been able to participate in, and I am so grateful. I am completely blind and totally disabled because of MS. This is why this meeting is so important to me. I don't have anyone to read my mail to me word for word or anything like that. Mr. Kildee, you are, I'm 55 years old. And you and your brother, I've been hearing your names almost as long as I've been able to read myself. I feel like that you guys are part of my family, and I am grateful for you must have a great bloodline. That's all I can say. My question is, I received SSI and, this, and Social Security. I have not uh, been able to file any kind of taxes because uh, because I'm poor and I, I don't have any dependents or anything um, since for at least five years. So my question was, one, am I eligible for the, um, the package? Uh, where should I be looking for it? at um and um excuse me I, th this call is not just for me I, everything i hear on this 
on this town hall meeting, I try. I get right back on the phone and call everybody I know and, and try to give them, pass on the information. So, um, can um, somebody please? Yeah, them thank you. Thank you so much, yes, Rita. Uh, Congressman, I don't know if you want to respond to Rita's question. Yes. First of all, thanks for your um, for your comments, and um, you know, I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through. I know a little bit about MS. Um, my wife, who's about your age, also has MS, and it's, it's a tough um, it's a tough disease. So um, I appreciate uh, the situation you're in. Regarding whether or not you would get the benefit, yes, um, you will. Uh, you, you know, you definitely qualify. Uh, SSI recipients qualify, and you would receive your stimulus payment in the same way that you would get your normal SSI benefits. So if it normally would come in through a direct deposit um, through SSI, that's the way your stimulus payment would come in. If you get a check, you know, then it would come by mail. And those, unfortunately, the, the, the checks that are being actually mailed, the paper checks, are taking a little bit longer. Uh, we ask them to prioritize, the Treasury Department, to prioritize the checks to go out to the people uh, starting with the lowest incomes, and they can do about 5 million checks a week, apparently. Uh, but on your specific situation, um, if you want to reach out to my office, again, I think we can potentially provide you that help uh, to just sort of navigate the process. I know it's often difficult. Um, you know, in any situation to navigate the process, but we would be happy to, to provide you that help. Thanks, Congressman. Um, it's 6.02, and we've been uh, going for about an hour, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I don't know if you had any um, conc uh, concluding remarks before we wrap up the town hall this evening? Sure. I just wanted to say thank you. You know, we I know it took a little bit longer at the beginning because I want to report back to you on things that are going on. And then I actually had to dash off and vote on this thing, so I apologize that I scrambled things up a little bit, but I have to do my job. Um, for those, and Mitchell might point this out, that for those of you who were in the queue for a question, uh, you'll have an opportunity to leave a message and we will get back to you on your questions. Um, my staff is here to help and they've been working very hard. I want to give them a shout out because they're a great team of people. It's a small, really hardworking group of folks who chose public service because they like helping people. So um, they do a great job for our district, and um, they're there to help if anybody needs specific help. And so reading your case, we'll make sure to, um, to connect with you to get you the help you need. So, Mitchell, that's it. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Congressman. We had uh, 4,300 people on the call tonight, uh, so I apologize that we weren't able to get to every single question. But as the Congressman um, said, uh, if you still have a question, if, we, if you didn't hear an answer to any of those questions we took, uh, feel free to stay on the line after um, we end this call tonight. You're going to be able to leave a voicemail uh, for the Congressman, and someone from Congressman Kildee's office will get back with you. So with that, um, we really appreciate um, everyone taking some time out of their days um, uh, to join us this evening. Again, uh, the Congressman's posting regular daily updates to his website, which is www.dankildee.house.gov uh, regarding the coronavirus. Uh, daily updates that you, you may find useful as well, and uh, the Congressman's office can also be reached by telephone at 810-238-8627. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. I uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you all so much, and have a great night.